Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's AMR discussion webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. The AMR discussions is a webinar series by gard scientific affairs team to complement our more technical Revive webinar series, which was established in 2018. The AMR discussions aim to provide a platform for discussions and debate of various topics related to AMR and antimicrobial R&D. As all of our webinars, today's session is being recorded and you will find the video soon under revive.gardp.org slash AMR discussions. And I also invite you to explore recordings of all our other webinars, including those uh, of the recordings of Revive webinars and GARDP webinars under revive.gardp.org slash webinars. The last few minutes of today's webinar are reserved for a Q&A session. And I invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by adding them in the questions window on your webinar control panel. And please remember to add the name of the speaker to whom your question is addressed. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. Today's discussion will explore what does the future look like if pull incentives to support antibiotic R&D are insufficient. Our panel includes Aaron Kesselheim for the Harvard, of the Harvard Medical School in the US, Radha Rangacharan from the CSI, CSIR Central Drug Research Institute in India, and Henry Skinner from the AMR Action Fund. Our moderator today is Laura Jung. Laura is a medical doctor and AMR researcher at the Leipzig University Medical Center in Germany. She also has a Master of Science in Public Health and experience as a global health consultant. Laura is currently working in, in clinically in infectious diseases and researching antimicrobial stewardship in Germany and Uganda. Welcome, Laura. Uh, thank you very much for leading uh, today's discussion. I'm now handing over to you. Thank you very much, Astrid, for the nice introduction and um, welcome, uh, everybody. Um, as Astrid mentioned, I put a lot of my work um, into limiting the excess use of existing antibiotics to preserve their effectiveness. But we also know that this will not be enough. And indeed, we need new drugs as a growing number of bacteria become resistant to the available antibiotics. Yet, we also know that there are a few new antibiotics in the development pipeline to take the place of the existing antibiotics. And we know that many pharmaceutical companies have exited the antibiotic R&D market in the past few decades and focused instead on more profitable therapeutic areas. While there is an agreement that we need more innovation in the antimicrobial development sector, there are different mechanisms being discussed to bring the new drugs to the market. And we also keep, need to keep in mind that we need to balance the development of new drugs while at the same time, we try to limit their excessive use. So I'm very happy that in today's session, um, we have an excellent panel of experts here with us to discuss what does the future look like if pull incentives to support antibiotic R&D are insufficient. And I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our three speakers here today. First of all, we have Aaron Kesselheim, who is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School, a primary care physician, and Aaron also created and helps lead the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law, short portal, which is an interdisciplinary research center focusing on the intersections among prescription drugs, medical devices, patient health outcomes, and regulatory practices and the law. He also recently developed a massive open online course on prescription drug regulation, costs, and access. So I guess he is really the right person to give us a short introduction into this topic in a couple of minutes. Um, secondly, I'm very pleased to welcome Radha Rangarajan, who is the, currently the director of the Central Drug Research Institute a consistent laboratory of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in India. She obtained her PhD from the Rockefeller University and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health. 
She has been involved in translational research and product development with AMR as a focus for the last two decades. And she also co-founded Witas Pharma, an antibacterial drug discovery and development company. Welcome, Radha. And last but not least, I'm also pleased to have Henry Skinner with us. He is the chief executive officer of the AMR Action Fund. Um, he is deeply versed in the economic and scientific challenges of antimicrobial drug development. And over the years, Henry has worked with many different companies, including Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, Pfizer, Pharmacia, and Lexicon Genetics. And in addition, he was also the CEO of Select X Pharmaceuticals, which focused on developing small molecule antimicrobials, as well as Neogenesis Pharmaceuticals, which developed a platform for identifying and optimizing drug candidates. And with this, I think we really have an excellent panel here together that brings really a lot of different experiences to this discussion. And I want to hand it over to Aaron, um, who's going to give us a short intro into this topic to start with. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Laura, and uh, thanks for the very warm introduction, and thanks to the Guard P folks for putting this together and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I think that the, the, the goal of this next hour is to talk about uh, the future of antibiotic research and development. The, the goal of the next couple of minutes was for me to provide a little bit of oversight of what the concept of a pull incentive is. Um, so. Um, you know, I think that that sometimes sometimes people categorize different incentives for development of drugs into two different big categories, push incentives and pull incentives. Push incentives are those that lower the cost of development of new products. Um, and so the, the main um, primary push incentive, for example, um, in the United States is government funding through the National Institutes of Health and government funding for um, antibiotic development around the world counts um, in this category as well. This is an extremely effective form of, um, in, uh, of developing new products. Um, a lot of the most transformative drugs that we have, um, both in the antimicrobial um, and antiviral space, um, as well as in, in cancer and other fields, derives um, directly from public funding. Um, sometimes even in the later stages of development as well. Um, and uh, the, another another variety of public, you know, the common variety of public funding is through grants and contracts um, to, to researchers. Um, another variety of it is a public-private partnership in which the public funding um, and the private partnership work, work directly together in developing a specific product. And we saw that work with um, extreme uh, success in the context of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, although there were um, issues with respect to the product, you know, being made available at a high price, uh, because uh, after all of that public funding, a lot of the control of the distribution of the product was uh, left to the private market to to handle, and and you know that the um, you know as a result. Um, there was a lot of controversy about the price the product was being made available at. But in terms of the development itself, the public-private partnership in that context was extremely effective. By contrast, pull incentives are ones that reward successful results um, after the in incentive has already been granted. Um, so the one of the one of the primary pull incentives that the market already has is for is market exclusivity. And um, in most cases, uh, new drugs, when they come to market, get automatic periods of market exclusivity that are protected by patents and are protected by local laws that affect that that give um, products guaranteed periods in which they can sell their product without the fear of direct competition. And during that time, drug companies sell their products for extremely high prices, make ex extraordinarily high revenues um, on their on their drugs. And um, those revenues are intended to reimburse the cost of, of, um, of upfront development and to allow those private companies to, to, or to earn a profit. Um, and so there has been some thought in the context of antibiotics to try to adjust those exclusivity periods in order to try to encourage more antibiotic development. 
It's been proposed, though never um, seriously proposed, to try to extend patent life in the context of antibiotics. Um, another series of proposals here has been to extend the regulatory exclusivity that prevents regulators from approving um, competing products that kind of runs simultaneous to um, patent life and usually serves as the as the bare minimum of market exclusivity. Um, so the United States, the 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 um, uh, Gain Act in 2012, which was part of the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, um, extended the guaranteed minimum period of market exclusivity for qualified infectious disease products for five to ten years. Um, however, uh, that has been uh, has not been been um, been found to work. Um, there has been no uptick in the in the rate of new introduction of antibiotics since then, um, in part because the regulatory exclusivity is routinely eclipsed by the market exclusivity that. Um, patents give for new antibiotics, which runs in the um, you know 14 to 15 year realm. So if you increase the the floor from from five to 10 years um, or seven to 12 years, um, you know that doesn't really add much. Um, another way of doing of, of of sort of doing the same idea is not to extend the exclusivity of the antibiotic itself, but to leverage um, lengthening other more profitable um, areas of of drug. Um, sales in order to provide incentives for antibiotics. So one of the examples of this in the U.S. is called the Priority Review Voucher, which is given to um, de uh, developers of new drugs for neglected tropical diseases, many of them uh, infectious diseases, um, that uh, that allows the the holder of this voucher to reduce the uh, uh, regulatory development time, the regulatory review time for another uh, more profitable product. And by bringing that product to market sooner and getting access to those extremely high prices that all drug companies charge for their new drugs, then, um, then the thought is, is that that will provide an incentive to develop neglected tropical diseases. Um, unfortunately, this also hasn't worked. Um, this, the Priority View Voucher for Neglected Tropical Diseases has been available in the US since 2007. This was a study that we published in JAMA and you can see there that in the years, in the decade before 2007 and in the decade after 2007, there is no introduction, no increase in the introduction of new, new drugs for neglected tropical diseases into clinical testing. Prior review voucher has been a failure on many different levels. It also uh, puts a lot of pressure on the, on the FDA that the FDA finds to be disruptive. Um, finally, there's been proposals around Transferable exclusivity vouchers. This is another proposal that's been discussed more recently in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in Europe, um, but also in the United States. Um, the idea would be um, the idea in the Revamp Act, which was proposed in 2018, was to give a 12-month patent extension um, to a um, to a, a, a presumably more important new drug if you get a new antibiotic approved. Um, we that was never approved in the United States. I think that that um, regulators and, and legislators in, in the EU are still considering this um, option, um, but we've done some economic studies of it um, and found that that such a voucher uh, might cost upwards of 4.5 billion dollars um, over the course of of, of 10 products um, and 27 billion dollars if you don't limit the kinds of products that it applies to. So this is an extremely costly um, proposal that. Um, Maybe you know, nonetheless, might might um, might be more effective if if these kinds of funds were put directly into the antibiotic development process. Um, a final uh, a final set of different potential pull incentives would be to offer prizes um, that would help uh, you know provide a payment for an antibiotic um, that was of particular public health importance. Um, these have been discussed. Um, there has not yet been any kind of prize of any substantial amount um, that's been offered. Um, there's uh, in, in the U.S. there was a proposal called the Disarm Act that was never passed uh, to provide an additional payment for an in-hospital use of antibiotics. Um, and most recently, there have been a lot of discussions around subscription contracts, um, which I know have been implemented in the U.K. Um, and have been proposed in the United States. The so-called Pasteur Act was proposed. Um, to provide a contract for a uh, new antibiotic that would pay up front for the antibiotic and then um, leave it up to the manufacturer to ensure commercial availability of the product. Um, in some other formulations of these additional payments, these prizes re 
put responsibility on the manufacturer to uh, not enforce their patents or to make their products available at low prices. This is a very this is a potentially promising area um, of of um, of pull incentives. Um, one of the issues, of course, is uh, is that um, you know this depends on the quality of the antibiotics that come into development. Um, and I think that some of the concerns about the application, at least of the Pasteur Act in the United States, has been that a lot of the new antibiotics and new products in, in the last few years approved by the FDA um, have not necessarily been um, transformative new products that are, you know, that show improved um, uh, outcomes in patients with resistant organisms, um, but again, just more tweaks and incremental changes to already available products that aren't tested in, um, in, in patients with, with resistant disease. And if we're going to go ahead and give a massive upfront payment um, to one of these new products, it really does need to be worth the, um, the, the investment. And so um, if we are going to go ahead with this kind of a pull incentive, we need to make sure that the, that the products that it's being attached to are, um, you know, deserve the, uh, <clears throat> deserve the payment that, um, that's being given to it. So um, I think that was a little bit of, a, of an intro from me, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Laura. Thank you very much, Aaron, for outlining uh, the different mechanisms, but also uh, some of their challenges and, and caveats. I think that's going to be really helpful for the upcoming discussion. Um, at this point, I just would like to remind everyone that you can also post your questions um, in the question box. and the experts on the panel are going to have the chance later to um, answer them, but uh, please don't hesitate to post them now already so we can collect them and put them forward. Um, and with this, I would like to already start um, our panel discussion. And I have the first questions for Rada, um, and they are going to go obviously a bit um, in the direction of India, which is one of like the biggest drug developers and producers um, worldwide. So um, Radha, maybe you could share with us a bit, um, how do the current incentives stimulate R&D um, in India and how can India also bring its strengths together to develop more antibiotics in the future? Thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, I want to thank the GARP team for bringing us all together on this very, very interesting um, topic. Um, so um, I, uh, I will I will try to give you uh, some perspective on what's happening in India. Uh, India is uh, often seen as a, as a place where uh, you know AMR is rampant, and um, it is also um, a place where new mechanisms of resistance such as NDM were first reported. Um, at the same time, uh, we have a, a very large thriving pharmaceutical industry, uh, where, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, pharmacy to the world, essentially. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize here that the industry in India, the pharmaceutical industry in India is largely uh, focused on um, the manufacture of generic drugs. Um, so the um, the discovery and development of novel drugs is something uh, that um, the industry does not uh, greatly participate in. So when it comes, so so there would be a handful of companies um, that uh, that could, that do uh, drug discovery and development work, including one company, Bugworks, which is uh, also uh, which is. Um, uh, focused entirely on AMR um, and is uh, developing novel antibiotics. So um, I, I have to say that uh, despite a thriving pharmaceutical industry, that, uh, uh, that the development or the discovery and development of antibiotics from the industry per se would be unrealistic. But what we have instead is a large, um, a large um, academic ecosystem and, uh, uh, and as well as a startup ecosystem. Um, and the nature of incentives in India is largely push focused. We really don't have full incentives, but it's all push. Uh, the grants uh, or support to researchers uh, comes from many sources, Department of Science and Technology, the 
uh, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, which I'm part of, Department of Biotechnology, and then we are funding to, to entrepreneurs as well as academics through uh, something called BIRAC, Biotechnology Industry Research, Ac uh, Research Assistance Council. Uh, but these um, parcels of money, like in many other places where push uh, mechanisms um, uh, are available, uh, it often feels like the grants and the mechanisms to fund AMR research are fragmented or, you know, they uh, they're very uh, spread out. There isn't a single place where everybody can go and apply for funding. So one needs to know when the calls are out and one needs to uh, apply in that uh, in that context. Um, so the quantum of funding that is available uh, for research is really good for preclinical uh, work, but it's really not very much uh, when it, uh, it it's really nearly not sufficient for clinical development. However, that too is changing now with the Indian Council of Medical Research announcing that it would fund phase one studies for uh, NCEs. Uh, so this is all a welcome sign. And I think that this is going to continue to, um, to ramp up because the Indian government is very serious about supporting AMR research. Um, so there was a national action plan on AMR that was put out in 2017, and a new one is currently um, under review. And while the 2017 national action plan focused much more on surveillance, uh, there is a growing recognition that India, with its strong academic ecosystem, uh, with, a, with a culture of R&D, could actually um, uh, contribute through uh, through the development of drugs and diagnostics and so I believe that funding will move in that direction as well through the national action plan um, there are other things so, going Alice, in you, you think you could uh, maybe share with us because you you mentioned that there is a lot of um, push incentives but not so much uh, pull incentives um, could you share with us what do you think are the challenges of implementing um, full incentives at this point? Sure. Uh, so the, the biggest challenge is really what is the source of funds? If it's going to come from the government, uh, there are many competing priorities. Uh, and, you know, India has a very mixed burden of disease. So uh, I think full incentives specifically focused on AMR are unlikely to work. But there are other mechanisms which I'd like to uh, which I'd like to briefly talk about. So um, you know the um, the pull incentives as we, as you know um, Aaron explained uh, very well uh, involves some sort of a uh, some sort of a mechanism by which companies can take products to market, but it's it's typically some uh, monetary or financial support. But we've had other kinds of uh, examples uh, in India that I that, that I can cite. Um, one is that uh, for TB and HIV, the government procures in bulk and then distributes or sells or makes available free of cost. So that is one model. The second model is if you look at the development of the rotavirus vaccine in India, it was completely supported by the government through the Department of Biotechnology. But this was together with a company called Bharat Biotech. When it went to market, uh, Bharat Biotech was asked to sell the vaccine at, a, at, a, at an affordable price in India, whereas they could sell at a price that they determined for the rest of the world. This ensured affordability and access uh, within India uh, for a highly uh, successful product that was supported entirely from, from the beginning uh, to market by the government. Uh, one other example is from my own institute, the Central Drug Research Institute. Uh, we developed um, a, a non-steroidal oral contraceptive, and this went to market in 1992. This was developed entirely at the institute through public funding. And when it went to market, uh, the license uh, was um, given to, an, to, a, uh, to a publicly funded pharmaceutical company, which then took it to market and sells it even today. It was a non-exclusive license, which allowed us to then license to other private companies as well, but a majority of the production even today is through the public, publicly funded pharma company. So these are other mechanisms through which one could take drugs to market uh, with public funding and ensure affordability and access. Thank you, Rana. That's 
that's awesome to hear these examples as well that um that gives us a bit of a better understanding of what could also be ways that that work um and great to get a, a country perspective especially from india which is so essential um when it comes to this topic um i would now like to pose a question to henry going a bit in a different um direction um henry the amr action fund is currently um, supporting, I believe, seven companies with the aim to help uh, launch two to four new antimicrobials within the next decade. So we are obviously very excited to uh, get to know from you, do you have enough drug candidates to reach your goal? And are there plans to maybe even include more companies in your portfolio to achieve that? I'll answer the second question first, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, drug development and discovery is a risky endeavor uh, in any field, and certainly in AMR as well. Um, that means we need multiple companies, different approaches, not only to treat different uh, pathogens and different uh, sites of infection, but just to manage the risk. Not everything will succeed, even if it's a good idea. Things that appear safe in preclinical studies may have issues in in clinical studies, and we need drugs that are both efficacious, um, uh, addressing resistance mechanisms that, that we otherwise can't address properly um, and are safe, right? And, and many of the patients, drugs and infections have comorbidities that require you know, a particular safety profile that, that might be related to liver or kidney toxicity, uh, et cetera. So it's a risky endeavor, and eight uh, or the seven that we have is not sufficient to to reach for approvals. I, I don't think uh, just just based on natural attrition or, or expected attrition. So we certainly will invest in more companies. I suspect we will invest in four or five or six this year to add to the portfolio. And at the end of this year, we'll probably be somewhere around 14 investments uh, across our portfolio, uh, and plan on in the years to come continue, continue to invest in new innovative opportunities. Um, so I guess that's the answer to your second question. Um, you know, on, on the first one, you know, I, I think it, it's pretty clear that these companies have lots of challenges. Um, it's very expensive. There, there's far too little investment um, to advance the companies. Uh, but, you know, we have two companies that uh, have filed, uh, at least with the FDA. So at least in one jurisdiction approvals, um, we had one company receive a CRL not due to safety or efficacy, but just manufacturing challenges that need to be gotten right. Um, and another PDUFA coming up uh, or approval decision coming up in April for another company. So while we're only a few years into our investments, we are we have line of sight to perhaps two approvals within our portfolio with, with more to come. So you know, it, it's achievable. I, I'd say the pipeline remains thin, the amount of, of True breakthrough innovation is modest um, within the pipeline. We have lots of uh, continuations of previous classes of drugs, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations that are useful, but not necessarily transformative for the field. So we, we desperately need you know, uh, what I would call high impact innovation, new mechanisms of action, that we have not had success in the past because they tend not to come with pools of resistance that are already existing. That mean those drugs longevity will probably be shorter than a truly novel mechanism uh, that we take through. Those come with additional risks. So the short is, yes, we have enough to get two to four. We really need a lot more innovation to address the range of infections and resistance mechanisms we need uh, and, and that will lead to drugs that uh, have the right profile to be accessible to patients where the patients are around the world and some of these drugs are very expensive to produce and that becomes a barrier even at the nominal cost of production to make them widely aware, available to much of the world. Thank you um, and, and now when you start already talking about availability Obviously, um, me as, as a clinical doctor, I'm kind of at the receiving uh, end of the R&D pipeline. And my question always is like, how do I get the drugs to my patients? And that's a relevant question in high-income countries, more so in low- and middle-income countries, 
So um, really, I would like to pose the question to you. What is the AMR Action Fund um, doing to ensure that the drugs are not only being developed, but they actually going to reach the patients? It, it, it's a great question, and it's one of the big challenges I think we face. And just to illustrate the scope of challenges, even within high-income countries, many high-income countries lack uh, appropriate access to most of the antibiotics. I think of the last 17 antibiotics approved, I believe only two or three are available in Canada, for example, right? The very wealthy country part of the G7. Um, similarly, the Nordic countries, um, you know, lack many of the, you know, currently available antibiotics in the U.S. Uh, to, to greater or lesser extents. And that's due to some market challenges, the size of the countries, and, and just the cost to bring it to each country. Each country has their own regulatory hurdles and, and necessities. Um, what we do at the AMR Action Fund, not only thinking more broadly you know, around the high income countries, but globally, is look to support our companies and guide them to form partnerships, because uh, these are small companies 30, maybe 100 people max that don't have expertise in much of, of the world. Perhaps they have some in the US, with the FDA and with the EMEA, um, but they don't have the competency and knowledge to bring these drugs to uh, the LMICs. Um, that, that's just a, a barrier too high, let alone understand how to distribute, et cetera. So we look to support the companies to build relationships with groups such as GuardP, um, and other companies around the world that have that knowledge that can support the company both financially, but more importantly, with the know-how and ability and the partner to bring those drugs once they're approved and shown to be safe and effective to the broadest market possible and to the greatest number of patients possible. So we do it largely through partnerships. Um, we do have some requirements on the companies to, to explore that. We can't finance it. This is a, a, a huge burden and ultimately I think it's a, a really public health problem that you know we need a, a collective solution across the globe to to find means to bring the drug to every patient. Yeah thank you. Um, and um, yeah as as you mentioned I think it's really important to kind of not make this access point an afterthought but really start thinking about it from the start and try to include it into all the plans. A very quick last question for you um, for a short answer is, in the absence of pull incentives, what, in your opinion, will be the consequences on financing of the innovation of new antimicrobials? I think there would be two consequences. The, the first is that if in the absence of pull incentives, we will continue to have an inability to finance through the public markets, companies trying to innovate and bring products to market and patients. And so the pipeline will continue to get ever thinner. And the push incentives are great, especially for the early work to really bring some exciting innovation forward. But it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a new antibiotic to bring it to to improve it safe in, in hundreds or, or a thousand patients or more uh, and show that it's effective in, in the way it should be. So the lack of pull incentives will continue the uh, inability to finance these companies, which means they'll go bankrupt. They won't be able to proceed and advance the innovations. The second thing is even where groups such as, as the AMR Action Fund fund the companies to approval in the absence of pull incentives, they will not be able to bring the drug to patients. It, it costs perhaps 30 to $50 million a year to maintain the drug just in the US market, not even to expand it to, to other parts of the world, be they high income or low income. So if it costs 30 million a year or 50 million, that's half a billion dollars over a decade the company doesn't have and can't get. The company goes bankrupt while that drug may be formally approved it doesn't get to patients anywhere because we can't afford to bring it to patients. So pull incentives are absolutely essential to maintain a market for these drugs and have them available to patients. Great, thank you. Um, and and with it, we are turning to Aaron um, again. And Aaron, uh, in the beginning, we mentioned that you've been in the field for um, quite some decades. And to prove that, we found an old paper of yours from 2010, um, together with uh, your colleague uh, Kevin Ortison, 
um, with the rather poetic title I find, uh, Fighting Antibiotic Resistance, Marrying New Financial Incentives to Meeting Public Health Goals. Um, I wrote it and then, it's great. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in this um, paper, you two reviewed proposals intended to bolster drug development, including such financial incentives for pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, and as such, strategies um, directly often conflict with the need to reduce the unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Um, so what I'm working on, you recommended a two-prong integrated strategy, which means it would increase the reimbursement for the appropriate evidence-based use of antibiotics that would also met the specific public health goals, such as re reducing illness levels while limiting the resistance. So now, 14 years on, how far have we got in achieving these goals? Has uh, these recommendations, have they ever been picked up? Um, thanks. I mean, I think that we have made very limited progress. Uh, I mean, I think ultimately here, the, um, the, the goal is to try to ensure that there is um, reasonable, um, you know, reimbursement available for products that deserve it. And I, I think that, um, I think that some of the points that Henry made um, were excellent um, about the, the, about the, the idea of, of pull incentives. And, you know, I don't think that, that you know, but I think that it is important to recognize that there are, that pull incentives aren't going away, um, that there are um, market exclusivity periods that drug companies have, and that drug companies have the abilities to charge very high prices for their products. And when companies don't sell their product, it's because the product doesn't deserve to be largely sold. And when a, when a product isn't available in Canada or a product isn't available in Norway, I'm not aware that there's a lot of evidence of people dying from infectious diseases at massive, um, in massive amounts in those countries. And so I think what that largely means is that unfortunately, a lot of these products aren't necessarily worth the um, the high expenses that that the that companies are are seeking for them, and so I think that what we proposed um, was to make um, to make uh, you know funding available and to and to provide adequate and appropriate reimbursement for the drugs when they deserve them, and not to provide that kind of funding for the drugs that don't deserve them. And so you know there I think there have been some um, um, very small steps made in that direction. Um, in the U.S., uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, which was passed in 2022 and was an effort to try to encourage Medicare to allow to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices for the first time, was the first time, at least here in the United States, that we um, took any steps to have the government negotiate prices based on the clinical benefits that a drug provides. And as I said, that's a very limited step. It's you know a very small number of drugs at the very end of their market exclusivity periods. But you know it was something that 14 years ago nobody would have ever imagined that like, the kind of step that the United States would take. Um, and I think that other countries are doing the same thing. They have health technology assessment organizations that assess the value of a product and you know help assign a fair price to it, and through that mechanism can help provide adequate reimbursement for. Uh, important new products. And I think um, all of us have kind of gotten to the the key point here, which is that unfortunately there aren't enough um, transformative new products that deserve the high prices that are available out there for the drugs that actually deserve it. And so what we really need is more um, investment in trying to get those products um, at the at the beginning of the of the process. Great. Um, thank you um, for this response. And maybe you could also um, tell us, like, in your opinion, what are like the barriers um, that you have encountered to achieve um, these, if you want, two-in-one goal? Well, I mean, I think that part of it is a lack of in, of, of investment in a lot in a lot of these in, in upfront discovery. You know, when when there was a, um, you know, when there was a need for, um, you know, greater treatments for, for cancer, um, a need for greater treatments for HIV over the last few decades, there has been a remarkable increase in public funding for those areas that has led to um, great discoveries and, and, and great advancements in, in, those, in those kinds of conditions. We haven't seen the same for um, antimicrobials and for, and for AMR. And I think that that involves not only basic science, but also investment in the um, you know, in the key clinical trials to show that the drugs actually work. I don't, I don't uh, mean to imply that we should stop 
um, you know, investment at the at the earliest basic science level. But I think we also need funding to help demonstrate not only the these products are um, you know might work in the in the petri dishes, uh, but also that they work in humans because I think that those kinds of trials are are very expensive and 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 critically important to 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 provide. So I think that um, I think that we need that kind of a you know a sustained combined investment from public and private sources together to try to identify these new products and test them appropriately in patients. And then, uh, of course, um, continue in, in, in collaboration to make them available of the kind that, that Rado was talking about. Perfect, thank you. Um, and with that, I would now um, give it to the audience questions. So also a last call for everyone who wants to put up a question, please send them in. Um, the question chat now so we can pick them up. Um, but we have quite um, some questions already. Um, and one is going a bit, I would say, in the One Health direction. Um, Rada, I don't know if you maybe can pick it up. Um, the question is that there is very little being done to create full, probably also push incentives for alternatives to livestock antibiotics, even so, um, reports show that most AMR genes are actually live in livestock and not in humans. And it's true that the discussion is often very much human health focused, but maybe you can give us an insight on that. Um, so it's true that uh, the discussion on preventing drug resistance uh, is often focused on um, antibiotic use in humans, but um, we know that uh, actually a very large amount of antibiotics get used um, for uh, in animal husbandry for growth promotion and um, certainly this is leading to drug resistance because often these uh, antibiotics are um, fed to the animals at subtherapeutic doses which is known to promote resistance and so there is um, uh, a very serious problem of uh, resistance emerging in, in animals and then transmitting or transferring over um, uh, to humans and all of the pathways through this uh, through which these um, the, these transfers happen uh, in other words the transmission dynamics are not fully understood and more research needs to happen on that front uh, so various um, I mean the one health approach is something that many governments are also pushing for and I think that has to go hand in hand and in parallel with uh, AMR um, R&D and AMR for drugs because we all know that when a drug, new drug goes to market uh, resistance is inevitable and it's going to pick up and by the time peak sales are achieved there's probably already resistance that is um, that is going to curtail its use so i think it's in everybody's interest to also look at um, uh, uh, how we can find substitutes um, uh, and, and 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 that's a very legitimate question but also i think we need to look at uh, you know how we can very uh, systematically separate between antibiotics that are used for animals versus those that are used for humans and uh, pay particular attention also to other uh, ways in which resistance spreads, such as through wastewater, you know, hospital discharges, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, these are all, in some uh, some some way, which we don't fully understand, coming back into uh, the human uh, chain. So, uh, the, you know, prevention of resistance is, of course, a very desirable goal, and I think money needs to go into it. And uh, at least in India, through the AMR Action Plan, there is discussion about this. Great, thank you. And and I think that just opens another door and shows us that the problem might be even bigger than than we sometimes think um, it is. Um, the next uh, question is. And, and maybe you can just give me a hand sign if you feel like you have a good example um, for that. The question is, is there any instance so far of a full incentive executed successfully with a small biotech company? Um, is there anything that you know of? The push or pull, Laura? I didn't get hear the question very well. Sorry, the, the question was, is there any instance 
than so far of a pull incentive that has been successfully implemented with a small biotech company. Well, again, I you know I maybe maybe Henry has some examples from his um, suite of companies and and their response to it. But again, I just want to make clear that pull incentives are kind of the norm, right? I mean, we have patents, the the patent system and the market exclusivity regulatory exclusivity system exist, and so it's not like there are no pull incentives now and we're going to try to think about how to how to create them like we live in a world of pull incentives in which um, all new drugs all new antibiotics in the market get a, a guaranteed period in the united states of at least 12 years of market exclusivity and th and then that is that's in in addition to whatever patents they have that cover them for you know 14 plus years so and that that pull in, that the whole system is construct is, is is designed around pull incentives so Maybe what the question really means is which of these additional pull incentives um, maybe maybe have been applied um, uh, successfully. Um, personally, you know, I think that the the one example that I know of that has been um, you know sort of trialed, although it has not been successful, is this idea of a subscription model um, has been you know rolled out in um, a couple different states in the United States around hepatitis C drugs. Um, so at least it's gotten past the like conceptual stage, uh, but I don't know that it's been successful in those places because you know they've not been able to um, to to get the the uh, hepatitis C antivirals to the people who need them. Right. Thank you. Um, and I, and I think again, very important point um, to make that there is these kind of pull incentives are are already there um in the way um in the market as well um one question um concerns the accessibility again i think we have touched on that but maybe um just to to make it um, clear again one more time the question is how concerned are you that pull incentives specifically could reduce the accessibility of new antibiotics in regions that can not afford the licensed product in the end. So um, going a bit in the direction of making things more expensive, I guess. I think it, it's hard to see how it makes it more expensive um, in, in my mind. And, and depending on how they're constructed and, and what obligations there are in various ways, I think they actually can enhance uh, access in a number of ways. Subscription models enhance access because you only receive that additional um, pull incentive if you make the drug accessible. Um, and, and that uh, is, is one of the great benefits of, of that model. Um, so I don't think it would make things worse and, and it could make them you know, substantially better, um, you know, depending on how they're constructed and what obligations come with them. So, so the question really is how you do it, right? That is um, an important part of it. Always. The, the devil's always in the detail, right? How do you value a new antibiotic? Uh, Professor Kesselheim pointed out not every antibiotic is, is as good as another one or even necessarily proven to be better than one that exists. But when they are proven to be better, then we have an appreciation of the value to, to patients um and the and public health and i think that needs to be recognized now how do you get there how do you support those sort of studies um and what is the value of that uh, and, and i think that's uh, a difficult challenge uh nice in the uk who which values drugs for the united kingdom has done a, a rigorous analysis of what is the value of a new antibiotic that looks like X uh, and have come up with a scheme for their subscription model that for the UK, based on the size of, of their economy and the population, that that's somewhere between five and 20 million pounds a year, depending on just what that antibiotic does. And so that illustrates one approach to placing a value on it on a sliding scale that recognizes that some antibiotics do more and are proven to do more. Uh, than others. And that's a very reasonable approach to go forward where you've proven superiority to standard of care. Um, you know, there needs to be recognition um, and those companies need to be supported to bring those uh, drugs to patients. Thank you. And, and I understand as well that it might depend on 
the structure of the system itself and it might not be transferable one to one from one country to another, right? I think uh, the problem with, uh, you know, having um, um, drug manufacturers go through the regulatory process in so many different countries to enable the introduction of the antibiotic in multiple geographies, this cost is not insignificant. So, in fact, I think if there's a pull incentive that works in one of the developed markets, then that might it, that might help and the company to take it to other geographies even without an incent without a pull incentive um, because they might then be able to afford uh, the regulatory process um, and if i'm thinking about india you know when india is a large market it's a volumes business you uh, pricing an antibiotic um, uh, the same way as the U.S. would simply not work because we would neither get accessibility nor uh, nor, uh, nor nor affordability because the patient pays for the most part. So in um, you know in this context, I imagine that a company that is incentivized uh, through a pull mechanism in the U.S. might still be willing to consider bringing the antibiotic to India, where it could sell in greater numbers. Uh, by going through the necessary regulatory process, which it may not be as open to doing without a pull incentive. That makes sense. Thank you. I have, um, I guess, a last, a bit more technical question, and that is what metrics do you think would be appropriate to analyze the success and failure of um, different mechanism and models, such as, for example, models being piloted in the UK right now? I think one of the key things that we need to remember is that this is a global problem and it's going to take global efforts with pull incentives to you know, solve the problem, so to speak, to, to put enough financial incentive forward uh, that investment flows and, and the right kind of clinical studies are financed, et cetera. Uh, and one of the challenges is making sure those are aligned. If, if each pull incentive is asking for something different, then the aggregate will not be sufficient to drive financing of the innovation. And ultimately, if done right, we should see the pipeline become enriched. We should see better antibiotics um, be tested and, and approved, and we should see substantial improvement in access. So ultimately, I think those are the metrics that you look at once these are in place, but recognizing development may take a decade from uh, interesting finding coming out of academia through preclinical and clinical studies and, and to be tested in, in hundreds or thousands of patients. So it's not going to be an instant measure. It's going to take time to see the progress and see the pipeline improve and to see that deliver new antibiotics. But ultimately, that those are the metrics I think one looks at. Also, I think the other metric to look at is what is the real clinical unmet need and how well does that particular antibiotic uh, address that unmet need? And here is where I think a pull mechanism could actually support very, very highly innovative products. Um, if, for example, a pull incentive defines upfront what kind of unmet need or what kind of TPP uh, the pull incentive will actually support. So uh, I think that, that that could be a way to measure success. Thank you. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, we are already uh, nearing the end of this uh, discussion. So I would like to ask each of you to give us maybe one very brief um, forward-looking statement on um, what do you think the global efforts and developments in which direction they should go? Um, I'm just going to start with the order on my screen. Um, so that would be Radha first. Thank you. Um, I believe that uh, AMR uh, is a very urgent, pressing problem that we all understand uh, needs solutions now. Uh, push and pull mechanisms both need to work. At the same time, the world needs to be um, in much working in a much more cohesive fashion 
to remove or reduce the barriers um, you know, uh, in terms of clinical development and regulatory frameworks so that we take drugs to market faster. Thank you. Thanks, Radha. And I give the word to Henry. I, I agree with, with everything Radha said, and I, I would extend it. You know, we need coordinated solutions, uh, which is always a challenge around the globe, but we need really to focus on the greatest priorities, the greatest patient need uh, in, in a coordinated way. Uh, that advances the innovation and, and solves patient problems and brings access forward. Uh, and I think that regulatory harmonization would, would reduce barriers um, and, and improve access as well, as Rada mentioned earlier. Great. And then last but not least, uh, Aaron. Um, I, I agree as well. I think that um, oftentimes pull, extra pull incentives are proposed because they seem easy. Um, they, you know, are things that uh, that that legislators um, can uh, write into law and say, you know, well, let's let just let this happen, um, you know. Uh, but but in fact, um, the really effective um, ways of trying to encourage new development that is it is sorely needed is a lot harder than that. And and as as Henry and Rada said, are going to require um, co uh, coordinated efforts across countries. Um, across um, sectors and are going to require um, investment. And so, um, you know, I think that we, we need to be, you know, moving towards those kinds of, of collaborations, to, uh, you know, and, and setting those up um, to try to help set the stage for the, the, the discoveries that we're going to need in the future. Thank you. It, it's always great for, for a moderator to end the discussion with uh, so much agreement between the the panelists, that makes it a bit easier for me. Um, I want to thank all of you for your great uh, contributions. I think that that helped a lot to kind of dive a bit deeper into this um, highly complex topic, um, actually, and understand what the challenges are. I think we all agree that innovation is needed, investment in the field is needed. Um, and that pull incentives can be a way to do that, but we really need to make sure that the money is spent right, that access uh, to the drugs at the end for the patients is ensured from the start. And I think we also understood that there is no uh, one fit all solution, um, but instead there is like, um, it's highly context dependent um, and system dependent on how we can um, implement these mechanisms and incentives. Um, and with that, I also want to thank uh, Guard P for organizing um, this very interesting discussion. Um, I hope that everyone could uh, take something away from this panel. I hope that we could answer all the questions that uh, came up. Um, thank you and goodbye, everyone.